Well, glory to God, it's Wednesday night, it's uh, 6.30. And that must mean that it is time to lift up our faith. Uh, it's Faith Lift Wednesday here at Beacon Hill, Assembly of God. And I'll tell you, we are in the middle of a heat wave. I'm telling you, the wind chill is only four below. Now that's not bad. Uh, our actual temperature did make it up to 10. It made it to 11 in Mount Morris. Uh, so I'll tell you what, things are looking up, man. Woo, glory to God. So uh, I'll tell you, last Sunday, 6 a.m. last uh, this past Sunday, the wind chill was minus 29. Uh, when I was having my second cup of coffee, I thought, man, it's a bit brisk. Wind chill minus 29. So uh, I'm happy. I'm happy that we made it up to 10 degrees above zero. So amen. All right, enough with that. We're going to head on over to Mark chapter 4 to get us started. So glad you could join us tonight. And this is the advanced class uh, this evening. And so thank you for joining us uh, in person and uh, virtually. Um, this has just been remarkable uh, that we're able to go well beyond the borders of our community uh, and just be able to reach, reach out and um, bring the word of God. Praise the Lord. We're so excited to be able to bring you the Word of God. About the only thing worth bringing anymore is the Word of God. So, little sister, you made it. And you're all bundled up. It's a heat wave out there right now. Oh, boy. Don't talk to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're excited that little, little sister is, uh, you know, I mean, bless her heart. She's leaving San Diego again to come to northern Illinois isn't it a blessed thing? I mean, she must love Jesus. And yeah, amen. So little, little sister, we can't wait to get you back where you belong. Mark chapter 4. And I want to show you something here to help us get started for, uh, for our message tonight. Mark chapter 4, Jesus is going to explain the parable of the sower. And we're going to go through this quickly here. Jesus says this in verse number, uh, chapter 4 of Mark's gospel, verse 13. He said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? These are they <clears throat> by the wayside. The sower soweth the word. Verse 14, the sower soweth the word. Okay, The word of God is being sown tonight. The sower soweth the word. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and he takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He doesn't even wait. He comes immediately. Verse 16, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. Isn't that interesting that affliction or persecution uh, is something that you can count on? to take away the word of God in your heart. You can count on that now. That's verse 17. Verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Verse 19 says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Okay, so, so far we have three different type uh, of uh, soil conditions. Uh, or heart conditions, perhaps we can say it that way. You have the wayside, you have the stony ground, and you have those among thorns. But now notice verse 20. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some an hundredfold. Well, this is what I lovingly refer to as the one quarter factor. The one quarter factor. Jesus talks about four different types of hearers. People that are receiving the word of God. He talks about the four different types. So we can, somewhere in, in this description here, we can find ourselves. Okay? And this is really important that you understand this. There's really no exceptions to this. And somewhere you will find yourself where you are uh, right now in your journey, in your faith walk. And of those four, three produce nothing. 
That's 75%. One quarter, however, or 25%, go on to produce. It says here some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. Now, if only one in four are actually going to hear and produce, uh, that's enough to get a guy discouraged, isn't it? You can almost get discouraged because as I look out there and then beyond and into the virtual world, there are those who are listening, but only one in four are going to hear and produce. Now, you have to determine that you're going to be that one quarter. You have to say to yourself, I am that 25 percenter. Me, I'm the one in four. I'm not the three out of four. I'm the one in four. Now, this is not to insult people. This is not to hurt people or criticize people. Uh, this is simply the way things are. It's just the way it is. One in four, the one quarter factor or the one uh, quarter principle. And so that's why, just in case you were wondering, why does the pastor speak so much about the same thing? Well, because only one in four at any given time are hearing and producing. At any given time. Now, why is that? Well, I'll tell you, if you're like me, there are times when physically you just might be tired and you're hard, it's hard for you to receive. Uh, there are times when maybe, uh, uh, you know, you have other things on your mind. I don't know. Uh, somehow or other, my mind likes to get very active during times when, I, when it should be quiet, you know. And so you have to say to yourself, okay, this is not, this is not an insult. This is just the way things are. And so the, uh, the more we um, reinforce the truth, the more we speak about things, right, the more likely you are to be able to grab a hold of it. The more likely you are to be able to hear and produce. So we're not doing anybody a disservice. We're actually, it's actually, I think, smart to say, hey, let's, let's talk about these things over and over and over because I do want you to get it. I'm more interested... This is important. I'm more interested in you catching a truth or a revelation. I'm more interested in that than I am in trying to impress you with new and deep revelation every time we meet. Now, we could do that. I could opt to go that route, but then we're not really reinforcing anything. You know, so the first time you hear it, you're like, wow, this guy's really dynamic. It's exciting, the revelation he brings forth. And then, okay, now I'm going to start working on the next time we meet and give you some more additional mind-blowing revelation. Well, how about, how about we just put it in our minds that it's more important for us to catch these truths, to catch them, to make them our own, even if it means I have to sound very repetitive or redundant. Even if it means I have to sound like I don't know anything else, I have a limited repertoire. Well, isn't, isn't that what Paul the Apostle said? I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, Paul was very educated. He knew a lot of stuff. But he said it was actually better. It's better for me to just limit things so that you can catch hold of this. So one out of four, not to insult anybody, only one out of four at any given time are going to produce. But it's interesting when you look at that verse 20, of that 25%, notice this, verse 20 again, these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30, 60, and some 100 fold. There's only one in three that are going to produce 100 fold of that 25%. It's just crazy. It just blows my mind. And I believe that Jesus gave us this. Uh, he said, listen, how are you going to understand all parables if you don't get this one? Right? So this is pretty important. So understanding that, understanding that, it's real, it's real important that you do understand that I want you to get this stuff. So we're going to piggyback on last week, uh, this past Sunday. We're going to just piggyback on that. And I, I'm not even going to say that I'm going to put the icing on the cake. I'm just going to put some finishing touches on that central theme because we were talking about bearing the family likeness. Remember that? This past Sunday was what we would call a reprise. 
This maybe we're just going to put some finishing touches. Maybe I'm going to smooth out the icing. I'm going to put a little more frosting over here where I went light on it. Maybe I'll glob it up over here. Maybe I'll take some away and, and eat it off my finger. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but Ephesians chapter 4 is where I'd like to invite your attention now. Ephesians chapter 4. Glory be to God. You know, pastors uh, fall into a lot of different temptations. I don't know if you knew that. And we're only human. You know, pastors are tempted to get discouraged. Pastors are even tempted to bear a burden that they shouldn't. We take things personal. Um, pastors that I know and love, uh, you know, the ones that I talk to uh, intimately, I'm not talking about surface and superficial like so many people do with each other. You know, we're all pretty much fighting the same battles. Um, discouragement, frustration, sometimes even anger. But, you know, Jesus got angry. Did you know that in the temple? Uh, he kind of threw a hissy fit. And I'm not really sure what a hissy fit is because uh, I never heard of that expression until I left the Northeast. I don't think anybody ever said hissy fit, you know. Um, but Jesus needed to cleanse that temple. And, and he said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. And he, he physically drove people out, made a whip, and threw over their tables and, and made a big mess. And, uh, you know, pastors sometimes are tempted to get irate. You know, it's like, guys, this is a holy thing that we're doing. This is a needful thing that we're a part of. And we have to be careful about what we bring into the gathering, like laziness, you know, an uncaring attitude perhaps, or, you know, bitterness or offense or people that are angry with one another. You know, you can check all that at the door and then you can pick it up on the way out. But when we come together, just tell yourself that, hey, listen, I want to receive this word and I don't want anything in the way. So, you know, sometimes it's good just to take a moment and say, okay, Lord, whew, forgive me. That was foolish. I should never have said that or done that on the way to church. Um, forgive me, Lord. And, and, and then it's done. Now let's move on, okay? Said that for someone, no doubt. Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse number. So this is Ephesians chapter 4. Did you get there yet? Verse number, uh, let's see, Gary, where do you want to take them? Ah, verse 20. Here we go. But you have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Verse uh, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true holiness. You have to put off and you have to put on. And in verse number 22 in the J.B. Phillips, it says this, fling off the dirty clothes of the old way of living, which were rotted through and through. Fling them off, the dirty clothes of the old way of living, because they were rotted through and through. The Amplified in verse number 23 says, be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 23, be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Well, it takes constant renewing, doesn't it? Our minds are wonderful things. They really are. But they need a governor put on them. They need tempering. They need manipulation. They need encouragement. The mind the mind. He's, he's speaking about your mind. And the Jerusalem Bible says, your mind must be renewed, I like this, by a spiritual revolution. By a spiritual revolution. A revolution is defined as, one definition says, the overthrow of a government by force in favor of a new system. The overthrow of a government by force in favor of a new system. Wow. Boy, that'll preach today, won't it? 
for more reasons than one. By force. You know, the kingdom of God, Jesus says, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent do what? Take it by force. By force. Um, in, in, and let me just show you this uh, in Colossians real quick. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1. It says this in chapter 1 of Colossians and in verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. This is Colossians 1.13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That word hath, it means it's already been done. We're not waiting to be delivered from the power of darkness. You are not waiting to be delivered from the power of darkness. And you have already been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. It's already happened spiritually. But now remember, when we talk about you, we're talking about you being a three-dimensional being. You are an eternal spirit. You're never going to go out of existence. You will never cease to exist. And this life that you're living right now, this temporary life, it'll be gone soon. And you will enter into the next realm, which will never end. Ever, ever, ever. This life is going to be gone shortly. In fact, the Bible describes it this way. What is your life? It's like a mist or a vapor. It appears for a moment and then it's gone. This life he's talking about. But you being an eternal spirit, in order for you to live on this planet in this life right now, uh, you have to live in a physical body, the one that you're in now. And you possess a soul, which is your mind, your intellect, and your emotions. But being translated or delivered out of one kingdom and placed into another, just because that is the truth spiritually, doesn't mean that you are experiencing it on the other dimensions. Most likely you're not. Most likely, if you're like me and most people, uh, you are not experiencing all that God has ordained for you right now. Because that's a process. It's a process. Um, in verse, uh, uh, um, chapter 3 of, uh, let's see, let me, let me get you back to Ephesians here real quick. I'm going to show you this. Um, in Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 3, it says this in verse, um, well, let's, let's do this. Let me just show you this prayer. Uh, chapter, Ephesians 3, the Ephesians 3 prayer, verse 13, where Paul said, wherefore, I, des I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It's one family right now in two worlds. You and I are a part of one family. There's not two families. The family of God is here and it is in the next world. Okay? One family, two worlds, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God that you might be filled. Now, it says exactly what you are reading, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. It means that you're not. Well, wait a minute, hold on. That's a contradiction. It actually isn't. Because in your spirit, man, you are completely full and you are perfected. You're everything, everything that you need to be in your spirit, man. In your mind, now that's a different story. In your body, that's a different story. You are three-dimensional, remember? You are three-dimensional. Paul is saying, I, I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God. It means that you are not yet in the other two dimensions, which would be your soul and your body, 
but it is possible. It is possible to have more of this life, because remember, we did talk about eternal life, Zoe life, the life and nature of God, that you have this life in your spirit, your born-again, recreated spirit is full of the, the divine life and attributes and the nature of God. Zoe, the DNA, really. I like, I like using it that way, too. I have new, uh, new genes. I got new DNA. But just because I have it on the inside, my inner man is full and alive. My inner man is connected to nothing but God. My inner man is connected to love. My inner, inner man is connected to peace and joy, Right? And we could say it this way, all of the ingredients of salvation are resonant within my born-again, recreated human heart. But my mind, whoo, boy, it's, even though it's a magical place, sometimes it's a very dark place. So it is possible to have all the fullness of God flowing throughout the three dimensions of Gary or the three dimensions of Jeffy Boy or the three dimensions of Brother CCB III Glory to God. Let them figure out who I'm talking about. <laughs> it is possible, and Paul is praying, I, I, I want you to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, and I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God. But, but how is this going to happen? Well, I refer you back to our opening passage here. Fling off the dirty clothes of the old way of living, which were rotted through and through. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind must be renewed by a spiritual revelation, a revolution. You need a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. In the carpenter of verse 24, uh, it is also possible to have your whole outlook revolutionized. In other words, in order for you to experience more of God, in, if this is what you want, if this is your goal and your desire, if you are looking to have more of God in your everyday life, then you've got to do something more with this thing up here. It's the only way. It, it, and there's no way to circumvent, I'll tell you. You know, people are thinking, well, if God wants it to be so, it'll just be that way. I, I know this is going to hurt you when I say this, but that's not the truth. Because God wants all men to be saved, and they're not. So that's not just happening. God wants all men to come to repentance, to repent and not to perish, but they are. They are perishing and they're not repenting. So what, what is that all about? Well, it's called your free will. Your, you have a free will and you have a God-protected right to choose to do the right thing and you have a God-protected right to choose to do the wrong thing. Isn't that humbling. I mean, it's sobering when you think about it. And so there are things, and, and we have been talking about, you know, bearing the family likeness. Um, if you're going to be filled with all the fullness of God, if you're going to be more Christ-like, you've got some work that you have to do. Uh, Colossians, again, I, I hate to have you bounce back and forth, but we'll wrap it up here. Colossians uh, chapter um, 3, if you wouldn't mind. Let's look at chapter 3. Let me show you this here. This is a gospel of accountability and it's a gospel of responsibility. You know, I know that salvation is a free gift. It is. You know, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yeah, absolutely. But this is also a gospel uh, of responsibility, accountability, and people... Let's face it, you know as well as I do, you know people, and I know people, who are living so far beneath their rights and privileges because this thing isn't renewed. And you can have and do have heaven in your heart if you are a child of God. And you are. I'm a child of God, you're a child of God. We got God on the inside. But man, some of us can have hell all day long going on up here. And ooh, that's why people get themselves into trouble. See, it doesn't mean that someone's a hypocrite. It doesn't mean that they're phony baloney, fake Christians, hypocrite. No, no, there's all kinds of expressions that we, you know, we coin these phrases and we use adjectives galore. And it's like, wait a minute. People are genuinely struggling right now. 
people are genuinely struggling. There's fear. It's everywhere. There's fear. There's fear, it's torment is what it is. It is perpe- fear is, is perpetrating its torment on people and their minds are just so full of it and so confused right now that the God inside of them seems like he's silent. Well, he's not, you just can't hear him. <clears throat> he's not silent, folks. <clears throat> God is speaking. He hasn't stopped. And in, Ephes- uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter three, It says this in verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on things on the earth. The trouble is we've got too many people with their affections focused down here. That's That's a bad thing. Because this life that you're living right now is fleeting, it's dissipating, it is going away rapidly. And you cannot have everything that you are, everything that you possess, everything that makes you, you. You can't have all of the investment into this life. Because this life is going to disappoint you. This life is going to fail you. This life is going to hurt you. And if you have everything invested in this life, uh, that's a, diff- that's a, a very challenging place to be. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse 3, for you are dead. Well, no, I'm not. No, I'm here. You see me. I see you. You're not dead. Well, no, the Bible says you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ and God. What the heck? What do you mean I'm dead? Well, see, that's the wonderful thing that took place when you opened up your heart and life to Jesus. Death and life occurred simultaneously. And I know it's a very complex thing that I'm trying to describe here. But when you opened up your heart and life to Jesus, however you did it, okay, there's no no prescribed formula per se. You you can't just come up with a rule book and everybody, you know, it's a checklist, check, check, check. No, it's a personal matter between your heart and God. However you opened up your heart and received Jesus, However you asked for forgiveness, however you asked him for help, however you committed yourself to him, when you did that, two things took place. The old you that you were died, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. The old person is gone. The old person, the spiritual person, now the real person, I'm not talking about the flesh, I'm not talking about the mind, I'm talking about the spirit being that you are, the spirit being that you are, dead and gone. So that means you, were, you used to be connected to nothing but failure. That person's dead and gone. You can't be connected to failure anymore unless you are up here. See, in your heart, you are connected to God now. That has been restored. You have this direct connect, direct connect to all of heaven all of heaven's resources. It's this thing that is between, watch this. Here's your heart. This thing is between you and heaven. Right there. So either either this thing is going to act as a block or you can open it up and watch this. Wow. That you be filled with all the fullness of God. Just like Paul said, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Be preserved blameless. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. All of you. You are a three-dimensional being. And so if we're talking about bearing the family likeness, and we have. We've talked about bearing the family likeness. Uh Uh-oh. My little device has just come loose. I'll just, yep. Uh, Design flaw, chief. (laughs) The clip keeps unclipping itself. Hmm, there's a sermon and all that. The, the bearing the family likeness, the importance, uh, the importance of getting a grip, well, get a grip on your lip, but also take charge of your thought life, we can never overemphasize or understate the importance of that. So when we talk about the same things over and over and over, it's because we're trying to get your, your um, train of thought to change. We're trying to get you thinking more in line with what God says you are right now spiritually and open up those channels 
and remove some of those hindrances because the truth of the matter is the biggest hindrances to your success and happiness are you. You are your own biggest hindrance. I am my own biggest hindrance. See, Satan already knows what you are. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. God's hiding you. God's hiding you in a place where Satan can't find you. Satan can't see you. Unless and until you do what? Speak your mouth with your mouth the wrong thing. Then the devil says, oh, I hear Gary's voice. I don't see Gary. I don't see Gary, but I hear his voice. He's whining and complaining again. See, what that did is that took me out of my hiding place and put me into a different arena. Let me just tell you this. Those of you, and myself included, when we deal with symptoms or a bad report or a diagnosis, if you got your mouth aligned with a bad report, if you've got your mouth aligned and hooked up to the symptoms, oh my, 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 my. That's a bad place to be because now the devil knows right where you're at. He doesn't see you. Your, your life is hid with Christ and God. He does not see you. But he can hear you. And so that leads me to my final point. Be careful of the words that you speak. Because the Bible says in Proverbs, death and life are in the power of your tongue or your words. So you find, you find out who you are and what you possess. You find out what God made you uh, by getting into the epistles, the letters. Epistles is just a fancy word for letters. Now, if you stay in the Gospels, that's fine, but... As a Christian, you won't grow and develop properly until you get over into the epistles. Okay? You following me? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four Gospels. The synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's in a category by itself, really. Uh, but if you want to grow and develop and be all that God intends for you to be, if you want to bear the family likeness, if you want to work the family business accurately you have to major or spend most of your time in, really, the Pauline revelation. The epistles, the letters that Paul wrote, primarily. Because Paul had a different view than the other guys. Even Peter said, even Peter said in his letter, he said, at the, he said listen, man, that stuff that Paul writes about, that stuff's hard to get with. That's hard to understand. That's the great apostle Peter said that about Paul. So major in the epistles, primarily the epistles of, of St. Paul the Apostle. What a tongue twister there. <laughs> and understand this, you have to do, put the work in to change your, your mindset. You have to seek those things which are above. You have to set your affection on. You have to put off and put on you have to purposely walk in him. You have to determine to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You have to do the work. Nobody's going to do it for you. My job is to encourage you, maybe even sometimes beg and plead with you, hopefully motivate you or inspire you, and, and sometimes, you know, if I have to, just grab you by the back of the neck and say, listen, listen, please listen. But you put the work in and I promise you, things will begin to change because God is not withholding anything that you need. Nothing. He's not withholding anything. In fact, in Matthew 6, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles seek after, all of those things that people think make up life, all of those things that think... People, people think it makes them happy. Those things will be added unto you as well. And that's been the secret of my life. And I'll just reveal this to you, this little secret, this little uh, tidbit here. When the going gets rough, sometimes I get a little fearful or confused or sometimes I get doubtful or maybe discouraged. I remind myself, Gary, 
You just keep seeking him first. You just keep seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these other things, they will be added unto you. They will be. What is it that you're, you're wanting to be added unto you? Well, that's really not your business. That's between me and God. But since you asked, I'll tell you. I want to see this church full and overflowing in person, not virtually. I want there to be standing room only. I want there to be overflow. I want the parking lot full and overflowing. I want people coming and weeping and falling and repenting before they even get into the building and crying out, God, save me. These are the things that my heart cries out for. I want to see people transformed. I want to see their lives put in, into order. I want to see people delivered from the things that are binding them. I don't want people struggling the way that they are. I don't want people, I don't, I don't want their marriages to fall apart and their, and their kids to end up in, uh, in rehab. I, I want people's lives to be better. I, these are the things that I, I see and, and cry out for. And sometimes when I don't see it in person or physically, I have to remind myself, you just keep focusing in on him. You just keep your eye on the prize and stay, stay focused. And all these other things that your heart cries out for, they'll be added unto you as well. See, because for me, it's not about promoting my platform. It's not about building my resume. My resume is complete. I ain't going nowhere else. This is it. After 25 years on this job, <laughs> I hate to put it to you that way, but it's been a job, all right. After 25 years of serving as your pastor, <laughs> folks, there ain't nothing else I'm looking for except what I described before. I want to see people blessed, saved, healed, delivered, and I want to see them come in wave after wave. That's what I want to see because that means it's your family and your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers that we're talking about. I want them to live the life that you're living. You know how to access the grace of God, don't you? You know how to get your prayers answered. You know how to get your needs met. You know how to get your bodies healed. You know how to get peace for your mind. They don't. They think that they do. So praise the Lord. Well, that might be a good place to just end and say, I think we put enough frosting on that cake. You guys get the point, right? You got some work to do, don't you? Well, I didn't think it was by works. Well, it's not. It's, it's a free gift. But if you're going to walk in the fullness of what he's planned for you, you got to do something with your mind constantly, continually. Okay? Well, let me pray. Father, I just want to thank you that your word is true. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we're never going to be the same again. We ain't never going back to the way things were. So I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters who have joined this journey, uh, joined me on this journey, Father. I thank you that we are walking this walk. We are talking this talk. We are putting off the former way, the, the old way of doing things, the old way of thinking, and we are putting on the new way, the new way of living, the new way of thinking, Father. And we are renewing our minds with your word of God, and we are changing the way we think, we are changing the way we see things. Thank you, Father, that we are everything you said we are. We have everything you said we have, and we can do everything you said we can do. We glorify you, we honor you, we reverence you, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. And listen, before we receive our offering, I just want to tell you I love you out there in Mevo land, virtually speaking. This ain't virtually speaking. This is me speaking plain and straight up. Thank you for watching and being a part of this. We bless you, we love you, we pray for you, and we speak over your life God's very best. We'll see you next time. Thank you.